Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series. I'm Tigris Osborne, the chair of NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, NAFA is the world's longest running fat rights organization. And through education, advocacy, and support, we try to create a better world for fat people where fat people are free of all kinds of oppression about our bodies and all of our other identities. You can learn more about NAFA at our website, naafa.org. And today's webinar is brought to you free of charge, courtesy of our generous donors. If you would like to support this and other kinds of programming, please visit nafa.org to make a contribution. Uh, before we introduce Sophie, I just wanna tell you that I am coming, although we are gathered here today in digital space and you are all in many, many places, I am coming to you from the greater Phoenix area in the United States. And this is the home of the o Odom people. Um, last, at our last webinar, we introduce land acknowledgments as an important piece of what we do, even though we're not meeting in physical space. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I called us guests on that land last time. And really what I should have called us is settlers because guests are invited. Um, so I encourage you to think about where you are coming from today. And if you don't know that, we can put some links in the chat that will help you figure that out. Um, Sophie, where are you coming from today? Oh, I am in London, England. So I'm on the on the home turf of all the colonizers. Um, so let me tell y'all, uh, for those of you who don't know Sophie, a little bit about Sophie. And, um, and of course, um, if you're watching this video or you're joining us live, um, we have fa fabulous interpreting today from the folks at Pro Bono ASL. Our interpreters today are Lex and Selena, and they're gonna be um, with us throughout today's episode. Okay, so Sophie. Sophie Hagen is a comedian, fat activist, writer, and podcaster whose work has made a huge impact since she won the Best Newcomer Award at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2015. She has written for The Guardian, Huffington Post, and Metro, sold out venues across the UK and Europe, and appeared in numerous television shows for the BBC, ITV, Comedy Central, and Dave, among others. Sophie hosted How to Love Your Fat, which ran on BBC Radio in Radio 4 in 2019. She presented a documentary on fatness for Denmark Channel DR2, and her TED Talk was shared worldwide. She has spoken to millions on her Made of Human podcast, now known as Who Hurt You? and Secret Dinosaur Cult podcast. This is her first book, Happy Fat, which we're going to talk about today and talk to Sophie about some of her other projects. Sophie Hagen, welcome to the NAFA webinar series. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thank you for being so patient with me and uh, trying to get this up and running. I believe I was meant to do it in May and then I just uh, kind of blanked you for and a then, year. <laughs> and then the world did what the world does and our lives did what our lives do. And here we are today. We got here. I'm so happy um, to be here. I, I had the pleasure of being invited by Sophie to be on her um, Who Hurt You podcast. And I think we recorded that in March, but it, it came out recently. Oh, yeah. um, you can see that on your favorite podcast episodes. Um, and um, and we had such a great time. So we were just really looking forward to do it again, but it was, um, you know, as things are sometimes hard to coordinate. But here we are and you've got lots of big things coming up. You're going on tour soon. I'm going on, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to finish my 2019 tour, which obviously was <laughs> cancelled and postponed a million times. So I have one date left, but I've just announced next year's tour. So next September, well, next May, my uh, Denmark and UK tour starts, which I'm just incredibly excited about. And um, and so for so some some of our audience will know you as a, as fat activist Sophie and not as much as comedian Sophie. Some of them will know you as comedian Sophie and not as much as fat activist Sophie. Just tell us a little bit about how like how'd you get to where you are today with this like sort of blended celebrity around you know being like <laughs> comedy famous and fat famous. I started with the comedy uh, when I started doing comedy, which is oh my god, eleven years ago now. Whoa. I um I was incredibly problematic, you know. I would do derogatory 
fat jokes on stage, you know, I was still sort of eating disordered and dieting and like my whole life was just like, oh, of course it's bad to be fat. So I went on stage and sort of reclaimed, uh, you know, the way that people would make fun of my size by doing it myself. And then I moved to the UK and found out that feminism was a thing, mm. uh, which was a huge <laughs> surprise to me. I thought feminism was just, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, the stereotypes about feminists and that I was fully buying into that at the time. So I discovered feminism and with feminism came, I'm trying to remember where it even stemmed from. Well, I met, um, I feel weird about calling myself an activist, especially in this space where people are actually activists. Uh, but I met a, a proper activist in Denmark called um, Andrea and she t showed me this world. She told me about fat acceptance and fat liberation. And I'm kind of grateful that she didn't introduce me to body positivity. You know, her whole reason for speaking to me in the first place was to say, um, I've seen you on stage. You have uh, a number of people every night listening to what you have to say. So you need to stop saying bad things about fat people. And then she explained, I was so, so innocent and ignorant. I was like, but why? So she explained, you know, that capitalism was a thing. And I was like, what's capitalism? So she explained everything. And uh, suddenly this world, like it's, the way I describe it in the book is like at the end of um, the Truman Show, the movie where he then realizes that his whole life he's lived in this uh, fake world. Yeah, and suddenly he, yeah, and then he realizes there's a world outside. And that's how it felt like, oh, so I've been lied to my entire life and actually things are different. And uh, it just kind of started from there. So on stage, I talk about my life, my thoughts, my feelings, me. And as I was discovering fat activism and fat acceptance, that just became part of what I talked about on stage. So it's, it's always been hard to properly you know <laughs> see the difference between it right how did your audience react to that change people who got people who were used to you as being like the self-deprecating fat girl and then you were all of a sudden like but wait actually the world is the problem not me how, how did your audience react to that so in the beginning I didn't have an audience right because I wasn't famous I didn't have anyone like I would only get to people who had just paid money to see comedy you know not anything spe specific so they're more like the general public mm -hmm. and it was incredibly difficult to do anything that was fat positive or even fat neutral you know my I would uh <laughs> I once went to um uh, I had a gallbladder thing I had to get a gallbladder surgery and before that I wasn't allowed to eat anything so for there was like a period of time where I'd lost a lot of weight so I went on stage and I said, I recently lost whatever X amount of pounds. I recently lost a lot of weight. And then the audience would obviously do what we expect them to do, which is to like whoop and cheer, like well done. And then I would just go, because I'm sick. <laughs> How dare you? And I would shout at them and they just didn't, they didn't, they don't think it's funny. Like they don't think me saying, oh yeah, by the way, so I know I'm fat and that's okay. I love my body. There's nothing wrong with that. People just couldn't relate to it. So it was very hard for that. They would be like, oh, you're joking about loving your body. That's a weird joke, but okay. Um, so it wasn't until I got my own audience and mm -hmm. people who were following me and people who already either already agreed or were convinced by me or the movement. Um, and that's who I enjoy the most getting to now, people who are already on board. Because otherwise it's so hard to, you have to have some kind of background information before you can laugh at something if it sounds weird to you. Like if I started joking about how the sun is blue, 
your inst your instinct wouldn't be to laugh. You it, your instinct would be to go. But hang. Oh wait, 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 wait. The sun is not blue. So like everyone knows the sun is not blue. <laughs> exactly. So then I would first have to explain that to you, and then you could laugh at the joke. So it's really good to gig to a room full of people who agree that the sun is blue. <laughs> right. Well, how did you? Um, what is funny about being fat? Because I think one of the things that's hard is like. In, in when we watch as an audience, when we watch comedians talk about their fat bodies, it is usually in that self-deprecating way, right? It's like, well, I gained 50 pounds or yeah, I lost 50 pounds or whatever it is. Um, but there are things that we know in our lived experience are hilarious about being fat. Um, is it okay to make jokes about those things? And like, who is it okay? Who gets to make those jokes? I'm still in two minds about that because whenever I see other fat comedians who do self-deprecating fat jokes, my heart sinks a bit and it makes me sad, both because I, I know where that comes from and I also know the effect it has, you know, um, and it'll usually affect people who are bigger than them as well. Um, and then there's another part of me that gets it. There is something powerful in a fat person being on stage who would be made fun of anyways, but now they're profiting from that. That, mm. that seems good to me. But so it's a bit of a, a bit of a minefield. I think I think it's funny. I, but I think most of what's funny about being fat is thin people and how thin people react to you being fat. That's when it's funny, is the tension in the room when you just say the F word and just like thin people just like, like <laughs> they just, they, they can't not say, you're not fat, you're beautiful. <laughs> like it just, it's like a compulsion for them. Uh, so most, like when I joke about fatness, I just joke about, thin people and usually like cis men you know and the them thinking that they are god's gift to us <laughs> that, that all we're doing is just hoping that a man will approach us and love us despite despite our fat so i think what's the most fun about being fat is thin people which is also coincidentally one of the worst things about being fat is thin people <laughs> Well, on the subject of on the subject of cis men, there's there's also the the opposite dynamic where there are the cis men who who love fat women, and that's all they want to tell you is how much they love fat women, how much they don't love thin women, how like uh, they, they just want to tell you all of that in all of the ways. That was my first ever fat positive joke. Was I, again, like eight, nine years ago when, because a guy had stopped, I'd been waiting for the bus and a guy stopped at the bus stop and was like, I need to have your phone number. And I would try to give him the wrong number, but then he tried calling it. So I had to give him the right number because I didn't know how to say no, because I was 20 something, right? So he, and then he, um, he said to me, I'm, I'm engaged and I just, I love my fiance so much and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with her. But I've just never been with one of your kind before. I was like, what? One of your kind. What do you mean? And I, I just thought that was so funny and weird. And so I started saying it on stage and talking about, you know, you know, it felt like being chosen as the leader of like a club. <laughs> I could like represent, you know, the, the pressure of being the, the only fat person he was ever going to sleep with, you know, because then he would just think that that's how we were all like in bed. And it was just quite a lot to be seen as representative of my people. <laughs> right. What um what what is funny about being fat? What do you love to talk about as a comedian on, when you're on stage? What are the, the besides making, you know, making fun of thin people in their attitudes? <laughs> what else is funny? I used to, one of my favorite bits, which doesn't work in English, only works in Danish, is about the sound that two fat stomachs make when two fat people have sex. Like, um, I used to, 
imagine it as two, you know, those like yoga balls, <laughs> like banging against each other. And that's just like a really funny image. That's one of my favorite images. Um, I think what's funny about being fat is, well, there's funny to whom, right? Because I think what's funny about being fat is so dependent on who you're talking to. I think yeah. you and I uh, could laugh for hours about various things of, you know, you try out clothes that doesn't fit, even though it says on the label that it's a big enough size, or, you know, you can joke about, you can, I went to a fat, um, fat activism conference in Amsterdam a few years ago. And afterwards we were all hanging out somewhere and someone sat on a chair and it collapsed. And there was a moment where we all reacted the way we would have reacted if there had been thin people there, which was, you know, you know, the tension, the oh no, oh no. And then we realized, oh, hang on, we're all fat and we all know what this is like. So we could just laugh and have fun with it. And like, no one was ashamed or no one felt bad because we got it. But had there just been one thin person there or even just someone who did not get it, that would have been a different situation. Yeah. So I think once no one else is there, we can talk about, you know, getting stuck on a toilet or, you know, having our bums rest up against a sanitary bin when we go to the bathroom or anything like that. Uh, but it very much depends on who's listening, because I think we I think we tend and that's a big generalization, but I think we tend to feel very responsible for thin people and their feelings mm. and how, you know, oh, we don't want to make them feel bad. So we shouldn't be saying these things out loud because then they'll, they'll feel really bad. Well, and we're conditioned to think that if we make them feel bad, then we have turned them off as potential allies. That mm. is our, you know, it's our responsibility, not just as nice people, but also as people who want to get them to be sympathetic to our causes. Um, that, you know, that if we hurt their feelings, that they might not care about us as much anymore. Um, yeah, and it's also self-protection, right? Because we've all tried mentioning the fatness thing to a thin person, and then somehow it becomes about them and how they feel and how they've always felt. And suddenly you're there fat hearing a, a thinner person say yeah I've always I mean I you you look great but like I could I just need to lose some weight because for my body it doesn't and then oh I mean I've you had carry people... it well <laughs> you carry it well but I wouldn't carry it well yeah but for me it's, it's it's not about like an ideal weight it's just more about like how I feel more like myself uh, you know and then you just stand there oh they come out to you as someone who hates fat people I've had that happen where they go Oh, I, I read your book and um, I, I just related so much. Like, I actually hate fat people too. I was like, <laughs> I'm not the person you need to tell that to. Like, what? Why do you think I'm going to say, oh, yeah, I get it. Like, what? That must be so hard for you. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. Do you find that um, that you sometimes forget that you're not in fat activist company and say things that would definitely be funny to people who uh, sort of already embrace a fat liberation politic but that to other fat people are sort of shocking or to other any people is, is just really shocking oh all the time and it's always to do with my job you know I'm uh because when I do I was doing a tv show and this um what, what are they called stylist person or makeup artist one of those was saying something about it's usually something practical you know like oh we'll get you a new jacket or we'll, I'll put the chair out on the stage or something practical and then I'll say not thinking about the situation I'll just be like oh make sure it's a chair that doesn't have um armrests or uh, are you sure that I don't that I don't want that chair it looks like I can't it can't hold me or you know oh, you don't have any jackets that I can fit into. And it's just, for me, it's a professional, you know, just practical, practical thing that I need, yeah, that I need to figure out because I'm on a job. And then suddenly it becomes this, oh, no, 
don't say that about yourself. Like, and then suddenly you have to carry that and be like, oh, no, 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 I'm not. I wasn't saying something about my, like, I'm just, I'm fat and I need a chair that can hold me. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, <laughs> It's fine. Um, and then it, it feels a bit like, like, oh, I wasn't really prepared to carry this right now. Right. Those, but also I did a fat, no, I did a buddy positivity conference uh, event where it was me and, oh, I keep, I forget his name, Kevin, he's a, a, a US influencer, stylish, uh, fat person, I, I, Kevin something. And we had to be uh, on the same stage being interviewed by someone about body positivity. And I came out first and I sat down in the, in the chair and uh, it was nice and roomy. And I uh, was, you know, they were like, welcome, thanks for being here. And then Kevin walked out and I realized, oh, this is not a chair. This is like, you know, like a love seat, like a oh. small <laughs> sofa. This was supposed but, to be for both of us. Yeah, so he had to sit on my lap, like two adult people, professionals. He was like sitting like on my lap while we were being interviewed about fatness. And it was my, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, are we all, it's in front of a huge audience. And I was just like, are we all seeing this? That at this body positivity conference, we had to sit on top of each other, literally. So and that I is wanna... funny. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it ain't, you know. It's um, funny and horrible, yeah. Yeah, I. so I know you also have a, a really fun story about sitting on the lap of someone famous um can yeah. you can you tell that story and then I want to go back to a couple of things that you've said about body positivity but I first I want to hear your I want you to share with others your your boy band lap sitting story yeah so if if people who are, are watching right now um it's because it's an Irish boy band so if you're all in the U.S. you will never have heard of them but they're like the in sync Backstreet Boys of the UK, right? So big deals, Westlife they were called. And I had to go, I didn't have to. I got to go on TV when I was 13 to meet them. And I was like, imagine the classic teenage boy band fan. I was like screaming and crying. It was a huge deal. And uh, there was this point at the end where the, uh, the producer of the show, uh, needed a shot where the whole band, five of the five Westlife uh, members of the band, and then me and my friend, we all had to be in the same shot so that we could be on uh, TV and say, oh, watch us on Sunday for this interview. And it was, you know, strict timing. We had to rush. We were being rushed out of there. So everyone in this room was just panicking. And then someone was just like, yeah, just sit, just sit on, the, on the Brian's lap. And Brian was my favorite and I was 13 and I was barely a small fat. I mean, I was like a chubby person, right? But I thought that I was so heavy that I would physically break the legs of this guy from my favorite band, this, this guy that I thought I was gonna marry because like I was so in love with him. And um, I ended up just shouting it, to all these adults in this room, just like, I'm not gonna sit on him, like pointing him right in his face behind me, just not gonna sit on him. And um, eventually he just like pulled me down and like placed me on his lap. And uh, he then started jumping up and down with his leg. So I would just be like vibrating, like, well, as you watch us on TV on Sunday. And um, he was very nice. He was said like, it's okay, it's fine. You're not gonna hurt me. And, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> This is horrible. It's horrible. Um, I mean, there's also maybe something about having a 13 year old girl sit on this boy band dude's lap in the first place, regardless of her size. But this was 2002. We didn't uh, we <laughs> think kids, about anything. Yeah, kids just had to sit, and that was it. <laughs> so, um, so you didn't break him. Um, but I think that moment like highlights a couple of things. I mean, first of all, what what 
does someone else do in that moment? Um, and you, you know, you've, I've heard you tell this story before and you talk about think, you know, feeling like the reason he was compassionate in that moment is because he was a formerly fat person himself. So he kind of got it. Is that right? I, I think, yeah. I mean, at the, at the time, I think that was one of the reasons that he was my favorite of the band was that he was the, the chubby one. And I think I felt a bit of, he was one of your kind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean it's knowing what I know now about this guy uh, I couldn't be more wrong but <laughs> uh, I, I the other thing that that story kind of illustrates is the the way that we especially when we are young people but I think many of us have done this at various stages of our lives think we are much bigger than we are um can you talk a little bit about in activist community we often talk about sort of gradations of fat right you refer to yourself as maybe barely a smaller fat then um so we talk about small fats and medium fats and super fats and antenna fats and death fats and um we have all this language in activist community that we use about it um that i'm not sure everybody else knows so like what does it mean to you to be the particular size of fat that you are versus another another size of fat as a fat activist it's so strange i have <laughs> i have had to ask a lot of uh, and it's so it's such a weird situation i've had to ask other fat activists how fat i am because i feel like every time i look in the mirror i see a different size and it's very like I don't, I don't mind whatever size I am, but I also just don't know. Um, so and also because usually we will, um, I think the most used chart. Because uh, again, there's no way of really there's no official chart, right? Um, but according to that, I would be. It would technically be a super fat. But then again, clo clothing sizes is what it you what it um, is what it refers to. They change so drastically that on that scale, I could be anything from a small fat to a, a super fat, or even an infinity fat at some point. So it's very hard, and I also understand that's why it's really hard for fat people in general to place themselves on that scale because so many of us have had this twisted look at our own bodies for so long that we find it so hard to be realistic about how big we actually are. Yeah. Um, for me, it's a constant reminder that I have privilege and it's not something that's, to be completely honest, it's not something that's easy to remind yourself because so much of my work and so much of my um, trauma has been about how I was the fattest one or you know the just the fat one or like my fatness was what made people be mean to me or whatever it was so it's very hard to think about how I am privileged um because there are people bigger than me and I had to remind myself when I feel <laughs> it's not that when I feel good about something I have to you know not feel good because feeling good is is fine you know you can feel happy that you can fit into a, a seat but when you do feel happy that doesn't mean you can then go ah well then this venue is perfect right it just means you can go oh thank god i'm going to be comfortable but it's not over because there will be people bigger than me who cannot fit into the seat so it's a it has to be something we constantly think about and and also, you know, I heard it from a doctor uh, when I got my uh, COVID booster, who said, when I said, out, like, oh, I'm fat, I might need a longer needle, because I learned that from the fat activism community, how great is that? Like, oh, maybe I need a longer, longer needle. And he checked, apparently my, my muscle is close to the surface, not to brag. <laughs> and I was I said to him like oh so you mean like if you gave it from underneath because that's like a, there's a lot of flop here and then and then he said like oh don't don't worry you're not that fat and it was that thing of your instinct which is based on having hated your body for 20 years was to go oh yes whew, I'm not that fat and then you go oh hang on 
that's mm. not internalized fat phobia that's fat phobia and that is me being fat phobic and that is not okay so it's about differentiating between your natural not natural your instinct which is also caused by trauma and then your duty to actually do the right thing and keep fighting for the for for everyone else basically yeah um because those access issues are different in different bodies things like needles and seats and you know other things that you've mentioned that you can be experiencing a lot of shaming and trauma as a smaller fat and not be experiencing some of those um access issues or sometimes even not not necessarily how big you are but which way your weight is like like the dimensions of your weight like you just said for if your arm had been fat on the other side you have a different issue or if you carry more weight in your hips you have a different issue and um and i think also we just don't like we culturally don't know what how what like what fat people look like if you're in activist community or you socialize in po fat positive circles you know bbw nightlife or any of those kinds of things you see a variety of bodies. Um, and if you don't, you kind of act like those bodies don't exist. And so what happens is people will be like, oh my God, that beast weighed 200 pounds. And it's like, that is, hello. I, you know, like I was watching a, a movie with friends and there's a scene in which a man is, a man is killed on an amusement park ride because the ride breaks. And then like mm. the punchline is like, well, that's what his fat ass gets for thinking he could go on this ride at 250 pounds. And my friends laughed and I went, do you all know that I weigh 320 pounds? Like, do you know, like, no. And they, they don't because no one can conceive of what that size looks like, unless you know people that size and know a variety of people that size. Um, it's why I, I use the hashtag, this is what 300 pounds looks like on my Instagram because that's mm. my general range most of the time. And I just want people to see like, it looks like this, you know? And it also looks like all these other things, but it, it also looks like this, right? So, yeah, I, I th sorry. No, please jump in. It just reminds me of fat suits in movies when whoever creates fat suits have, no, have never seen a fat person before. They just take a thin body and go, oh, I guess that's bigger. And then that's bigger. <laughs> and then maybe I'll just have a lumps here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like let's put some lumps like just there. <laughs> and it's like, it's so much easier just hiring a fat person than you standing in your basement trying to guess what a fat person looks like. Hire fat people, hire fat performers, no fat suits. Um, so this, so the the issue of like, the range of fatness and how it affects us in the physical world and how it affects us in terms of oppressive attitudes. Um, how does that connect with, I know that that connects with some of your thoughts about body positivity versus fat liberation. Can we talk about why you are so um, adamant at reminding people that you are not a body positivity influencer, you are a fat liberationist? I. <laughs> I see the I see where body positivity has a place. You know, I think body positivity is better than nothing at all. Uh, I am well, honestly, part of it is because I believe fat liberation is the right thing, right? Because that's about changing the culture and society, and it has nothing to do with the individual sort of loving their body. And that's from a very logical brain point of view, but from a very personal point of view, I, I really don't like when people read me wrong. And I so often get, you know, oh, you're just so happy and so positive and you just want everyone to love their curves and and there's something about it that makes me feel so anxious that I am not being seen or listened to or heard. And the people see past who I actually am and all they see is a fat body and they go, happy, jolly, 
you just care about people and almost put me in this maternal place where I, you know, the amount of audience members who've told me all of their trauma because it just sort of assumed that I should help them with that. And there's some, like, so I, I want to, I feel quite adamant about going, no, stop, stop putting me in this category where I'm a super nice person because that is a pedestal that I do not want to be on because then I can't do anything before you are then disappointed that I am actually not the, the nicest person in the world. I don't know if this makes sense. Do you know? We actually titled this webinar when we were advertising it, Happy Fat, parentheses, and other fat feelings, because I know that you often talk about feelings other than happiness. Um, and I'm curious about whether you had hesitation about naming the book Happy Fat. Like, did you ever <laughs> worry that it was going to? Okay, <laughs> I guess that's my answer. Um, well, Sophie's gonna answer this question, y'all. And if you have questions, you should start putting them in the chat. Um, did you worry that if you named the book Happy Fat, you were like reinforcing some jolly stereotype? Let me see how I can say this in a very diplomatic way. I had a vision of the book and a plan for the book. My editor had a vision for the book and a plan with the book. And the book is somewhere in the middle. And that's not exclusively something I disagree with because I do think that if I had gotten my way 100%, it wouldn't have reached the right people. Mm. That is true. But there are things that I would have happily have changed that I don't think would have affected in a bad way. So uh, with the title, I wanted to call it something like my, my fat manifesto or um, fucking fat or something like that. My, my editor suggested, my body is okay and so is yours. So we met somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I'm good enough, I'm smart enough and gosh darn it, people like me. Yeah, and so <laughs> her, her point of view was, you know, this is gonna be lying in some bookshop somewhere and the people we wanna reach, you know, wouldn't see my fat manifesto and go, oh, I need to read that you know, because it's a, it's very much a, an introduction to fat liberation. And, you know, it's not like a, um, oh, I forgot her name now. Anyways, it's not like a, a, a comprehensive academic text, you know, it is very easy oh, like to Charlotte understand. Cooper. Charlotte Cooper, yes, why did I forget that? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a proper, just like jokey, almost like memoir um, mixed with, you know, some strong opinions, but they were very much softened mm -hmm. <laughs> by my editor. Um, so I, I could see the point in calling it happy fat uh, and making it more sort of, hey, I'm not threatening. He <laughs> he, you just might want to read this and have a little jokey joke laugh about, com uh, about being fat and comedy. Um, and then once they read it, they realize, oh, she seems angry. <laughs> because a lot of it is very angry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it makes you very angry. <laughs> a lot of life as a fat person makes you very angry. Um, mm. I, I want to talk about the word manifesto since you mentioned that, because I know one of the things that we have in common is that we are feel very indebted to the fat underground and they are Fat Liberation Manifesto. Um, can you share a little bit of that for people who might be watching or listening who don't um, know what that is? You, know, you mean the sort of original manifesto, the Fat Manifesto? Yeah. yeah. Yes, and this is the reason why I um, am beginning to step away from calling myself an activist because mainly because my memory is so bad. Um, the, the story that I remember hearing for the first time about the Fat Underground is the fat in, where 500 fat people met in Central Park in New York and burned diet books and had banners that said, um, diets are a cure that, diets, a diet is a cure that doesn't work for a disease that doesn't exist. Um, 
And there was a fat manifesto, which was, I'm just going to say 10 <laughs> rules. Maybe I'm thinking of um, the 10 commandments. Which is no, I, think it has, I think there are 10 points in the fat manifesto. I think you're right about that. Either that, or you know, the Bible, um, <laughs> which is about uh, the things that we actually want to change. And when I think about fat liberation, they are the, um, the rules that I think of, you know, it's, uh, we don't want, uh, they call them something, min minima minimizing, what's it called, like minimizing machines or something? The, the, um, the minimizing industry. Yeah, something like right. that, yeah. It, sound, it sounded, it was something I really it's liked, and then I forgot about it. term for diet culture. Diet culture, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, it's against uh, medical fat phobia and um, legal fat phobia and basically it's the system, right? We need to change the system. We don't need to change yeah. ourselves. And that's what I'm trying to, uh, I, I put it um, in the back of the book so that people could see it because yeah. As yes, you can tell, you, the, it says it much better itself than I do. <laughs> yes, 1973, um, the Fat Liberation Manifesto credited to Judy's spirit and Aldebaran, but it's um, mm -hmm. the um, the Fat Underground is the the group that we uh, that they represented, and it was sort of a a fat uh, radical feminist collective. And you can see the manifesto in Sophie's book. Um, oh, there are seven. I always think that oh. there are two as well. Oh, but it depends on how you break them because a couple of them, can, well, anyway, you can see it in Sophie's book. Um, you can also easily find it by Googling and the Fat Underground has, there's a, a, a historic video from the early seventies of the Fat Underground that's now available on YouTube. So y'all should all oh. check that out. And I didn't on even the, know I that. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't think it's been available for very long, but it's there on YouTube now. It's a little grainy, but it's worth taking a look at if you're serious about fat activism or feminism. And it's, um, and you know, you can see the sort of like where, um, on our website, on NAFA's website, under the about section, there's a little bit of history about where NAFA fits in between the fat, uh, the fat in, and the uh, Fat Liberation Manifesto. Um, you know where we have a role in that. Um, so Bill wants to know if uh, Bill says an editor can kill a good book. Did you get good support from yours? Um. <laughs> She definitely helped me stick to a deadline. Um, apart from that, we sort of had some disagreements uh, on, you know, the main topic of my book, which is fatness and whether or not that's okay. So the the main argument we had was when it came to uh so, so a lot of the things that she criticized she was right about which is the first draft of the book was incredibly angry and it just it was just in, it was just me screaming and shouting at whoever was reading the book and but the people who are reading the book are not the people i need to scream and shout at you know the people i want to scream and shout at would never even touch the book so that was that was a good call but when i started writing the book um i insisted on having it um i insisted on not talking about health i was uh, i took from uh cat Posse, who's an incredible fat activist who's currently in new zealand and because she when i interviewed her for my podcast she talked about how she was no longer answering questions about health because you know we've tried that <laughs> since mm -hmm. the 80s and people are not listening and it's not about health at all what we're talking about has nothing to do with health so I made that point to my editor uh, I'm not even going to mention health in the book and that's almost a statement in itself and then my editor insisted that I did mention that I should talk about health because that would that was going to be the question that everyone had so I was like oh, okay fine so I hired Kevin Bay um, who's also an amazing fat activist that I know from Twitter. And he did so much research on everything to do with health. Like we had the big, the longest document. And I wrote a huge chapter about health and about the, 
you know, how it's not necessarily unhealthy to be fat and how it's actually not about health and how it's okay if you are unhealthy. And like, I tried to make all of the points about it. And I even went into how um, this whole healthism thing about how everyone should be healthy. Uh, you can trace that straight back to Hitler and one of his main ideals, right? Uh, so I went in and basically called everyone Nazis if they cared about health. And then suddenly she, my editor said, I don't think you should have a health chapter because, <laughs> because what she thought, when I said I wanted a health, she thought I was going to do a chapter about how unhealthy how it is. exercise as a fat lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just like, of course it's a bit unhealthy, but blah, blah. So then I was like, oh, no, 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 you were right. We are going to have this health chapter. And then that became, <laughs> she just wouldn't accept it. She wouldn't accept that it wasn't unhealthy to be fat. And that lasted months and months. And I ended up um, getting an outside editor because we just wouldn't agree. Like she just, she wouldn't allow it to be published like that. And I wouldn't allow her to take it out. So then we had an outside editor who looked at it and was like, this is all fine. Like, this it's, can be published. Really, it's really remarkable sometimes seeing people work on fat projects that will be um, available in the wider media, not just, you know, where the audience is not necessarily fat activism, but those people are rooted in fat activism. The, how much pressure there is to kill the things that are the most political or the most, and also like how easy it is to define it as the most political. It's like just, I'm unapologetically fat. That's too political, you know? Um, I, I think about someone like Crystal Bougon who uh, used to run a really popular um, fat women's lingerie store here in the States and who got numerous offers for television shows. And whenever she would say like, I don't want to talk about dieting on the show, they'd be like, "Never mind, we'll, you know, we'll try it another time or whatever. Like, did you get pressure to talk about dieting or do you want to, can you say anything about your pressure in the industry about weight loss? Do you mean with the book or just in general? Either. Uh, everyone wants to talk about health all the time. It's all about health. Everything is health. Uh, and all trauma or like, why, why are you fat? Talk about why you are fat. And it's such a tricky one <laughs> because uh, because I also talk about my childhood in my comedy and sometimes journalists will see it as an in to go like oh but you did talk about your abusive grandfather so are you saying that basically all fat people are severely mentally ill because they were abused no I didn't say that um, I've had some real arguments with journalists um, I had one who who kept saying are you saying it's more healthy to eat uh, sweets than vegetables? And I refused to answer. I was like, I don't, I don't accept the premise of your question. So like, for whom, who are we talking about? Someone who's allergic to vegetables and who has low blood sugar? Mm -hmm. She was like, no, you know what I mean? I was like, you know what I mean? And she ended okay. up just like abandoning the interview. Um, Reagan Chastain says, don't show up with uh, everybody knows. Don't show up to an evidence fight with everybody knows as your evidence. Like, you, everybody knows that vegetables are more healthy. Or like, you know, that's the, you know yeah. what I mean. Kind of sounds like that. Um, okay, so we have another question. Uh, this one actually comes from our publicity director, Amanda, who says, I loved what you said about the power of fat community, how you can laugh at breaking a chair in fat community. But I also heard what you said about not being able to do the comedy you want in front of folks who don't get it. But as a NAFA board member, I do want to reach the people who don't get it yet. Have you any, have you had any experience that I can learn from? So my instinct with that. So I think writing the book and in general, just discovering fat activism there was a long, long, long period of time where I was just angry and where I could not, I just couldn't care about people who didn't get it. I just didn't care. I just wanted to scream and shout and be really angry. And I just wanted my fat audience. And I'm now finally at the point where I am beginning to gig to those people again who don't get it. And annoyingly, what I've learned is that screaming and shouting doesn't help which is annoying because I'm really good at that you know they want it helps me sometimes it helps us sometimes oh we I mean my god 
<laughs> like we deserve to scream and shout. Um, and I have for a long time. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, at the end of this to read the poem at the very end of my last chapter. Okay, I'll get I, ready. Because I'll, 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 make, I'll make a point um, <laughs> about that. Um, unfortunately, it's about having patience and some of it is about catering to thin people, saying things like, of course, we all struggle, which is not untrue. Uh, it's just annoying having to say it. I am lucky that I have comedy because comedy is an excellent way of communicating something. Um, it's I, what I find what I find really easy to do is to direct that work to someone who is basically thin and who does the work well and I don't know how many there are I know someone like Megan Crabb here in the in the UK who is known on the internet as Buddy Pussy Panda mm -hmm. she's very very good she's very much positivity pastel colors a beautiful Instagram feed one point something million followers and she will talk about um uh like loving your body but then she will also guide people towards people like, like me, like, um, uh, like NAFA, like, you know, people who are actually doing the work, uh, the more sort of <laughs> um, less fun work for people to read about. Because I really like it when thin people take charge of that conversation and they sort of educate each other. Yes. I think that is and also because if someone's fat phobic, they're going to listen to thin people more than more than they're gonna listen to us. Like that's and as, just and as much as we hate that, it's just part of the like the thing that is. Yeah. And then I think, unfortunately, I think it's really helpful. And that I think that goes for most uh social justice fights, showing people that they're not gonna get it from one day to the next. Like this isn't this isn't something you're expected to know about. It's not something that you're expected to be able to get. You're not expect you're not even ex like I'm non-binary as well. And a lot of the frustration I see in people who don't get it is that they're frustrated that they don't understand it. And what I keep coming back to is saying, you don't have to understand it, you just have to accept it. Because understanding it takes a long time. It took me a long time to understand feminism and fat liberation and and all of this. Yes. Uh, and like anti-racism uh, anti work as well. Of course, I wouldn't understand that the second I became aware of it, but I knew that, okay, this is the information I'm getting, that I should be doing this and that. So I just shut up until I had understood it and I just followed the rules that I was given by the people who knew what they were talking about until I understood it personally. Yeah. You know, I don't need to understand it in order to do what the, the people who are, uh, belong to the oppressed group have told me to do so that's what I keep trying to tell thin people is like hey maybe you don't need to know all the statistics and all of the you know all of the questions you have about but I thought it was unhealthy or whatever maybe you just need to right now just listen and I'm telling you it's not about health health isn't relevant or you know just be nice to to fat people or armrests are evil most chairs right. are evil and then you can always learn to yourself in your room or whatever, but you don't need to understand it in order to be- the, Show basic like respect person. about your human beings. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I think about that a lot because of the word acceptance in our name and what it means to um, be an organization that is striving. We're, we're not actually striving for acceptance. We're actually striving for full liberation, but but there's we're we're the starting point platform right and then we will hopefully move you along to other more radical organizations who are doing even more revolutionary work but it is part of our role i think in community to um to be the, the where people begin to get it so we um so that other people who are tired of the beginners like we've accepted that as part of our role like we know where we you know however we might individually feel tired sometimes of doing the sort of like intro level conversation again that that's part of what we're here to do and sometimes acceptance is not even 
that you have to accept that it's okay. Just that you have to accept that it is. Fat people mm. are. <laughs> We're not knowing any. They're all. They always were. There always will be. And you just have to accept that basic fact of life that fat people are. Whether it makes you mad, sad, angry, whatever it makes you feel, we're still here. Right? Yeah. And and accept and we're here for a long time because we're not all dying when we're thirty, <laughs> like we like to tell us we are going to. Right? Have you made it past thirty? How old are you, Sophie? I just turned thirty-three, mm-hmm. and See? my grandmother. My grandmother has eaten nothing but butter her entire life, and she's turning 90, 98. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm beginning to hope that I die young because I'm not gonna. No. I do not want to be ninety eight years old. I do, I do not. Wanna, I, I do. Not. I want to be. I want to be like Batty Winkle. Look up Batty Winkle, y'all. She's not fat, <laughs> but she's uh, unapologetic about her life. And um, okay, so we. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time together. And I just want to make sure that, let me just double check. I don't see any other questions um, from the audience. I just want to, um, well, you want me to do, you had an assignment for me. Yeah. So it, the, it, it fully answers the, the question that, um, that Bill had earlier. So would you mind reading the, the poem at the very it? end? It's, I think it's before the manifesto. Okay, let's after see. the sort of afterward. Is it the practice starts with practice self care? Not that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I should read this like poetry slam style. <laughs> um, practice self care. Uncover your strength. Never give up. Cry apologetically. Hug yourself whole. Nourish your body. Always keep fighting. Zoom in on your worth. I believe in you. Start believing in you too. Would you read um, the first letter of each sentence? Queen's Nazi. <laughs> Y'all can see it. I was not allowed to say anything bad about Nazis in the book. So this was my way of saying punch Nazis without my editor uh, seeing it. So oh she god, had no really. idea. She was like, oh my God, I love the poem. It's just like everything, it just really sums you up, like the whole book about how it's all about loving yourself. And I was like, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. I was so surprised by it. I should have actually said the letters P-U-N-C-H. N-A-Z-I-S and let everybody else come to that discovery themselves. But I was so surprised. Um, like I don't write poems. That's a bad poem. Like I know <laughs> that's a bad poem. <laughs> and I, I just read well, I was like, is this what she means by poem? This just this is like bullet <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for thinking more of me than me actually ending a book with a poem. Of course I'm never gonna end a book with a poem. <laughs> I think that should be your challenge for your next book. <laughs> a highly quotable, fat, positive poem. Um, Sophie, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you want to leave us with? Uh, I could talk to you forever. And it's so much, it's, this is so much fun. And I'm, I'm quite humbled by just being in contact with NAFA. And yeah, it, it, it feels... I'm very honored to be a part of the conversation that we're all having about this. I know that my way of doing activism, if that is what I'm doing, is, is kind of odd because it's very centered on me uh, because <laughs> I'm the, a comedian and it's all very personality focused. Um, but I do really hope, here's what I will hope. Um, I really hope that people know that I'm very willing to be called out on things because I constantly want to do better. And I know it's really awkward and weird calling people out or calling people in, but I know that there are people watching this who know a lot more than me. And I am, I just want to make it very clear that I'm very, very open to it. And if I do have a bad reaction, I have it inside of myself and I know it's a bad reaction. And I will still say, thank you very much. (laughs) Even if I have to cry myself to sleep, I'll be like, you know what? Thank you very much. You're right. I'm really glad that you actually said that, Sophie, because it is a thing that I meant to say about following you on social media. And um, where, ha- where can people follow you on so- social media? 
I'm mostly on Instagram. And uh, okay. if you uh, want to be held uh, more updated, then my newsletter is, is the way to go. Um, Sophie, we need to make a TikTok of this poem, though, because... <laughs> We both need to be on TikTok more than we are. Um, oh, Sophie's true. Instagram is Sophie Hagen DK, right? Yes, which stands for and Denmark, that, not penis. I, I okay, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I never thought that it did, but I get some people do. People. Um, and it's <laughs> Sophie with an F. Um, there's another Instagram called Sophie is spelled with an F, right? that is uh, to get people to your right place. But if you follow Sophie, Sophie on social media, um, you will see Sophie share her learning around. Um, and Sophie, you like she and they, and I haven't yeah. been alternating. Um, so- No, I'm, I'm like fine with- alternate? I'm absolutely, I re pronouns don't, I feel nothing when it comes to pronouns. You could call me literally anything. My thing is about being called woman or lady, girl, anything like that. That's where I go, Ugh. Oh, so as long as I'm person, you can say she, they, who I don't, I could not care less. Thank you for um, letting me ask that and for telling me. Um, the, um, when, you, when you watch, you will see posts from Sophie about being called out and about the sort of like step-by-step -step emotional reaction of like, this is how I felt, but this is what I've learned I needed to do. And this is why I'm grateful for it even though it felt uncomfortable for me. And I, I actually think that that's one of the things that is really valuable. I, you know, I'm always looking for like what funny thing you posted or whatever, but like when you do that, that, that kind of example of making mistakes and still being in community with folks instead of making mistakes and then getting mad and leaving, like picking up your toys and going, um, I think is really invaluable to your followers who are new to intersectional feminism. And, and also, and also, it turns out, to people who are not new to it, like there are some of the most sort of um, hardcore activisty intersectional feminist people will handle being called out badly, you know. So I think it's my plan. I'm just trying to be as human as possible, as honest as possible, and as and I'm trying the hardest I can to do the right things, and that's that sometimes feels like you can be either or. You can either be super honest and human or you can do the right thing. But I'm trying to do both and say, oh yeah, listen, I'm gonna fuck up so much. Like my profile, my comedy, none of that's a safe space because I am a human being and I'm white. Like I'm gonna fuck, of course I'm gonna fuck up. Like I'm socialized to being a horrible person. So part of me is a horrible person and I need to figure out how to be less of a horrible person. And that is my platform and my comedy and my book. And that's who I am is, hey, I'm gonna fuck up. But that only means, please, like I am only grateful if I am told when I fuck up because I love learning and I just wanna be a good person. Let's end on that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, Thank you to, um, once again, to our ASL interpreters from Pro Bono ASL, Lex and Selena. And um, thank you to all of you who were here. Oh, the thing that we, the new thing we also introduced last time that you and I didn't do, Sophie, is give a little visual description for folks who might be listening to this. I know it's kind of yes. late in the show to do that, but um, do you want to tell folks where they've been listening to you, like what it looks like, where they've been listening to you from if they're not here with us visually? In my background, we have a real plant and we have a fake plant. And then we have a plant themed wallpaper, stick and peel behind me. It's actually my kitchen, but I think it might look a bit more like an office. I'm not sure. And then there's some um, fairy lights. And I, you can see me sort of from chest up. I have my hair up in a bun. I have big black headphones on. I have a green, emerald green. Uh, let's calm down a bit with the description a green shirt on <laughs> i am always torn with descriptions and i i should seek more guidance from um people in disability justice community around like i because i want to say all the things and i've been given feedback that like nobody wants to hear all or read all of that or listen to their reading device say all of that right yeah um but so i am a, a mixed race black woman with fluffy ish hair i am wearing a purple dress and rose gold glasses earrings and necklace 
and I'm sitting in front of a dark wall with the NAFA logos on the wall behind me. Um, and often throughout this webinar, I've been holding up Sophie's book, Happy Fats, which has a picture of Sophie on the front with her bare midriff painted with the um, with, a, with a smiley, a femme smiley face. Um, so that's what you've missed if you have been listening to us instead of watching. Um, and of course, um, once again, we thank you all for your time for joining us. Um, we thank Pro Bono ASL and all of the team at NAFA behind the scenes who helps us put on these webinars. And of course, those of you who donate to NAFA and help us be able to offer these kinds of things to our community free of charge. Um, and we thank Sophie Hagen for joining us today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We'll see you all next time on the NAFA webinar series. Take care.